Almost exactly a hundred years after the sack of Baghdad in 1258, an Arab author reflected on the end of the Abbasid Caliphate and its once glorious capital. Taking pen to paper about the reign of the Caliph al-Nasir, who had ruled from 1180 to 1225, he wrote, From this time, the Caliphs were in control of an area smaller than the ring around the moon. The dynasty continued in that manner until the power of the Caliphs was destroyed by Hulagu Khan, ruler of the Mongols, who took possession of the part of the Muslim empire that had been theirs. The author's name was Ibn Khaldun, and this extract comes from his magnum opus, the Muqaddimah. Born in Tangier in the year 1332, Ibn Khaldun spent a great deal of time musing on empires before offering a credible explanation about how and why they rise and fall and explaining what replaces them. Ibn Khaldun's amusing reference to the Muslim empire having been reduced to an area smaller than the ring around the moon may have reflected some naivete about the size of the distant moon but it's a cutting insight into how far the stewards of the world's largest empire had fallen. As he continues in the Muqaddimah, thus the authority of the dynasty becomes successively narrower than it had been at the beginning. This process continues until the dynasty is destroyed. This fact can be demonstrated by examining any dynasty large or small. In this lecture, I'm going to address several issues that surround or are suggested by the history of the Islamic Golden Age. When placed side by side, we'll see them broadly tackling the big picture question, what happened next? That is, what happened after invading Mongol hordes raised Baghdad to the ground in 1258? heralding what we think of as the end of the Islamic Golden Age. The first question I'll deal with is, what happened next in the political life of the Muslim Middle East? The answer to that will help us understand how the new political reality made it almost impossible for the Golden Age to continue as it had before. Then we'll examine what happened to the intellectual life of the Islamic Golden Age. Are we right to say this Golden Age simply ground to a halt? Or can an argument be made that the spirit of inquiry may have survived, albeit in new forms, in those lands where Muslim rulers held power? Finally, we'll capture a glimpse of the impact the Islamic Golden Age had in the lands beyond the Muslim world, especially in Europe. This will be the moment to stop and think about the Islamic Golden Age as a source of the European Renaissance, which started in Northern Italy in the 14th century. So now, to start thinking about what happened next in the political life of the Muslim Middle East, let's commence a journey across the length and breadth of the Muslim world as it stood almost exactly a hundred years after the sack of Baghdad. Our guide is Ibn Battuta, the great medieval traveller who spent 30 years of his life advancing across 75,000 miles throughout the Muslim world and beyond. Ibn Battuta's far-flung accounts of India and China are fascinating in their own right but we will accompany him only so far as he passes through North Africa and the lands of the defunct Abbasid Caliphate. The journey began one morning in June 1325, when the 21-year-old Ibn Battuta left home for the first of many great adventures. His homeland of Morocco was then ruled by the Marinid dynasty, the Sunni Muslim Berber tribe that had replaced Almohad rule in Morocco in the year 1244, and which temporarily reigned over parts of northern Africa from the mid-13th 
through part of the 15th century. To the north lay the last remaining Muslim state in Andalusia, the Emirate of Granada in modern-day Spain. Since 1238, Granada had been ruled by the Nazarids, a dynasty that would re remain in power until 1492, when their state would fall to the Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella. Ibn Battuta travelled first from Morocco across North Africa, through the kingdom of Tlemcen, which covered much of modern Algeria and was ruled by the Zionids. Moving east, Ibn Battuta wandered through the Hafsid kingdom, which covered eastern Algeria, Tunisia and much of the coast in modern Libya. Like the Marinids in Morocco, the Nazarids in Granada and the Zionids in Algeria, the Hafsids had established their independence in the 1230s, following the collapse of the Almohad Empire. Now, the point of listing these nascent dynasties is to emphasize just how different and more fractured the political situation was now in North Africa than only a few hundred years earlier. Before 750, when the Sunni Muslim Abbasids came to power, their rivals and predecessors, the Umayyads, had ruled the entire Muslim world as one united empire or caliphate. When the Abbasids took over, they lost Andalusia to the Umayyads in exile. But most of the rest of their domains remained intact for another century, though eventually they would also lose other bits of the empire to new powers, such as the Fatimids, a rival Shia caliphate that came to rule most of North Africa from its own capital in Cairo. Even so, most of the Muslim world was still controlled by a few large empires, such as the Almohads in North Africa and the Baghdad-based Abbasids. These big powers typically made use of local governors to maintain order. In time, a number of these purportedly loyal governors broke away from their masters, establishing small independent fiefdoms. Egypt offers a further example of this move to independence with the subsequent rise of the Mamluks in 1250 and their more than 250 years in power. From this time on, smaller political entities in North Africa would be the norm for about the next 300 years, until most of the region beyond Morocco came under Ottoman control. And a similar situation was playing out in the rest of the Muslim world through which Ibn Battuta was travelling. Modern Oman was ruled by the indigenous Navhani dynasty. Yemen was under the control of the Turkic Rasulids, and the Hejaz the region that covers Western Arabian Peninsula was ruled from 1201 to 1925 by the Sharifs of Mecca. Meanwhile, the massive Ilkhanate or Mongol Empire was the southwestern part of the larger Mongol Empire and it was established by Halagu Khan in the wake of his conquest of the region in the 13th century covering most of modern Iran, Iraq, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, Turkmenistan, and parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Ilkhanate struck Ibn Battuta, as he passed through it subsequently, as a mighty and seemingly unshakable realm. However, the arrival of the Black Death would change everything. In 1330, the plague killed the ruler of the Ilkhanate and his sons. With no heir apparent, the Ilkhanate was torn apart by a multitude of ambitious men, Mongols, Turks and Persians, who established a host of petty states where one existed previously. When Ibn Battuta himself first visited Baghdad in 1327, he had thought the mighty Ilkhanate 
which, after all, had sacked Baghdad to be invincible. Instead, it imploded. And so, when Ibn Battuta passed back through the Ilkhanate in 1347, he was astonished at the demise of the kingdom that only a few years earlier had struck him as so mighty. As Ibn Battuta now continued moving west, beyond the lands of the former Ilkhanate, on his homeward journey, he saw evidence everywhere of the devastation caused by the Black Death, which had spread throughout the Middle East and into Europe. And as in Europe, the loss of so many lives upset social order and political life all across the Middle East. So far, we've reviewed some of the political upheaval caused by the collapse of the region's large empires, including the Almohads, Abbasids, and the Mongol Ilkhanate, and noted how the arrival of the Black Death added to the turmoil. All of this made the continuation of the Islamic Golden Age as it had existed in Baghdad, Cairo, Cordoba, and elsewhere, impossible, practically speaking. But now I'm going to touch on a third element that contributed to political uncertainty for the 150 years after the end of the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad in 1258, and that's gunpowder. Gunpowder, discovered and developed in China, arrived in the Middle East either just before or concurrent with the arrival of the Mongols who would introduce it to Europe. The conquering Mongol armies that were the first to employ this dynamic, even revolutionary, new addition to their armaments did so to devastating effect. The earliest written mention of gunpowder in Arabic comes from the pen of the Syrian Mamluk engineer and proto-chemist Hassan al-Rama. Writing in 1280, al-Rama talks about the powder's Chinese roots and refers to saltpeter, the all-important oxidizing chemical in gunpowder, as thalj al-sin, or Chinese snow. So, the arrival of Chinese snow was a powerful variable that was capable of facilitating sudden and unexpected shifts in power and political upheaval. The political power that mastered the production and use of gunpowder in battle would establish an unassailable regional dominance that could, possibly, last for centuries. In the case of the Middle East, that power would be the Ottomans. Although the Ottoman Empire was founded in 1299, they didn't use gunpowder until 1399. After that, they went on a conquering spree from the Caspian and Black, Mediterranean and Red Seas to the Persian Gulf. There's a beautiful passage in volume six of Edward Gibbon's massive and magisterial 18th century work, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Referring to the discovery and spread of gunpowder, Gibbon writes, if we contrast the rapid progress of this mischievous discovery with the slow and laborious advances of reason, science, and the arts of peace, a philosopher, according to his temper, will laugh or weep at the folly of mankind. I couldn't put it better myself. With the rise of the Ottomans, Another great period of intellectual and cultural greatness emerged, something akin to the Islamic Golden Age. But does this imply that between 1258 and, say, 1520, and the rise of Suleiman the Magnificent, the apex of Ottoman power, that there was a 300-year break in intellectual advancement in the region? No. Rather, the end of the Abbasid Caliphate resulted in the loss of a large empire and a period of regional instability that saw the emergence of multiple new powers, coupled 
with the loss of financial security and investment in learning on the same imperial scale. Even so, advances in numerous fields were ongoing. As we can see, from a post-1258 roll call of great names and their achievements. Indeed, even amid the turmoil of the Mongol invasions, research was continuing in those lands the Mongols failed to conquer. For instance, the physician Ibn al-Nafis, born in Damascus and working in Cairo until his death in 1288, was making astonishing advancements in the medical sciences. Ibn al-Nafis was the first person to accurately describe the pulmonary circulation of blood. His commentary on anatomy in Avicenna's Canon, written in 1242, when Ibn al-Nafis was just 29 years old, gives a detailed description of pulmonary circulation 400 years before the English physician William Harvey, who is typically credited with the discovery, published his own account in 1628. Ibn Battuta himself was not only a great traveller, but also an important scholar in these post-Golden Age years. The full title of his account of Morty more than 30 years on the road is A Gift to Those Who Contemplate the Wonders of Cities and the Marvels of Travelling. More widely and concisely known as the Rikhla, or Travels, this book is one of the most important documents in the field of medieval history, often offering the sole first-hand account of distant places. Another great scholar and contemporary was the astronomer Ibn al-Shatir, who was born in the same year as Ibn Battuta in 1304 and who spent his working life in Damascus. Ibn al-Shatir's most famous astronomical text is known in English as The Final Quest Concerning the Rectification of Principles. In this work, Ibn al-Shatir overturned Ptolemy's model of the movement of the sun, moon and planets, a theoretical model which had held sway for 1200 years. Although his system remained geocentric, Ibn al-Shatir's mathematical calculations were identical to those that would be employed by Copernicus some 200 years later. Another contemporaneous scholar who is certainly worthy of our attention was the anatomist and physician Mansur ibn Ilyas, who was born around the year 1350 in the Persian city of Shiraz. Although virtually unknown in the West today, outside of specialist circles, his most famous work is housed in the world's largest medical library, the US National Library of Medicine in Bethesda, Maryland. Another accomplished scholar of the post-Golden Age era was this Mansur ibn Ilyas, the late 14th century and early 15th century physician, author and illustrator of the world's first atlas of the human body in colour, known as Mansur's anatomy. A final name I'd like to bring to your attention is Uleg Beg, who was born in 1394 in the Persian city of Sultaniya. Uleg Beg was a grandson of Timur, the fierce and ruthless founder of the eponymous Timurid Empire and who's known in the West as Timur the Lame, or Tamerlane. Uleg Beg himself was both a Timurid Sultan and a noted mathematician and astronomer. Demonstrating my point about the continuation of scholarship after 1258, Uleg Beg built an enormous observatory in Samarkand, an ancient city on the Silk Road in modern-day Uzbekistan with walls of polished marble, and that was in the 1420s. A passionate and dedicated scholar, Oleg Beg also produced 
The Zij e Sultani, or the Sultan's Star Chart, in collaboration with others. This astronomical catalogue logs the position of some 994 stars. And it was not only the largest such collection since the Greco Egyptian Ptolemy's own work in the 1st century AD, but it also corrected numerous errors made by that great scholar of the ancient world. I hope these names go some way toward demonstrating the holes in any argument that scholarship in the Middle East ceased after 1258. I could go on with a catalogue of names and their achievements from Arab, Turkic and Persian lands in the period following the sack of Baghdad. But I'd prefer to move on to consider another legacy of the Islamic Golden Age. I consider the Islamic Golden Age's scholarly influence on subsequent Western learning to be one of the most exciting of all its legacies at the conclusion of this dynamic 500 plus year period. From Andalusia to Persia, and in everything from fashions to foodstuffs and the three course meal, and from toothpaste to architecture, algebra, algorithms, and astronomy medicine and mechanical devices, the wealth of this cultural legacy and scholarship is truly staggering. Pinpointing every piece of the puzzle that informed the European Renaissance would be a virtually endless task. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that the Islamic Golden Age was a mere intellectual conduit, merely funneling wisdom from Greece and Rome into Western Europe. Rather, in the words of the Anglo-American historian Bernard Lewis, the Abbasid Caliphate and its predecessors, the Umayyads, were the richest and most diverse of all pre-modern empires. Lewis notes that before the rise of these Islamic empires, virtually all civilizations in China, India, Europe, the Americas, were limited to one region one culture, usually one race. Continuing, Lewis says, The Islamic culture of the Middle East was the first that was truly international, intercultural, interracial, in a sense even intercontinental. And its contribution, both direct and indirect, to the modern world is immense. I'll go even further and add that the achievements of this remarkable era would not have been possible had it not relied on and benefited from the work of even earlier and some contemporaneous scholars from numerous different and distinct ethnic, religious and cultural backgrounds, including Arab, Berber, Persian, Turk, Iberian and Chinese, Muslim, Jew, Christian, Hindu, Zoroastrian, and others. To conclude this lecture, I'll return to the beginning and ask a question that's at the heart of the entire era. It's a question I think we should also keep uppermost in our thoughts even today. And that is, what makes a golden age golden? Now, it might strike you as a bit late in the day to ask such a question. But I beg to differ. Whether at the beginning of a journey or towards its conclusion, it's always a good idea to know where you're headed. If not, how will we know when we've arrived? In the words of the late great George Harrison, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. As we approach the end of this course on the history and achievements of the Islamic Golden Age, I think this is the ideal moment to reconsider what we mean by a golden age. I've just mentioned the Renaissance, an historical period that's often referred to as a golden era in European history. And there's no arguing against the brilliance of Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Galileo and Copernicus. But at the same time, the period of the European Renaissance was also marked by warfare and poverty, religious 
and political persecution. Accusations of witchcraft were often enough to see a woman burned at the stake, while the same fate was meted out in Rome in 1600 to the friar, philosopher and mathematician Giordano Bruno for defending Copernican ideas of a heliocentric or sun-centered universe. The later Elizabethan era, which ran from 1558 to 1603, is often called a golden age of English history, not least because of Shakespeare's plays and the Crown's sponsorship of global exploration, including the charter granted to Sir Walter Raleigh to establish and colonize Virginia in 1584, a colony that was named for Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. At this time too, religious and other forms of persecution were rife and torture widespread. Conservative estimates put the number of Catholics executed under Elizabeth at between 200 and 500 by beheading, hanging or being hung, drawn and quartered. Do these failings, the sort of persecution that one hopes would be universally condemned today, mean the eras weren't golden? I think it's sometimes hard not to compare these times, including the Islamic Golden Age, with our own. But such an exercise must ultimately prove fruitless. The British novelist L. P. Hartley opens his most famous novel, The Go-Between, with this line. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Since I first read these words as a schoolboy, I've understood them as highlighting how things are in a constant state of change on both a personal and national level, and from the past to our own day. The certainties that people once lived by can often strike us as very odd indeed. What's common to all Golden Ages, the European Renaissance, the Elizabethan era, the Islamic Golden Age, and indeed 5th century BC Greece, is that they advanced culture and learning further than their predecessors. They produced a sense of progress, a looking forward, and the belief in better things to come. Whether that was in the development of new philosophical modes, enhanced mathematical and scientific understanding, or the creation of new, better architectural and artistic forms. And then, at a certain point, it comes to an end. The exact moment when a golden age stops or is replaced by another isn't always easy to see. In the case of the Islamic Golden Age, there was a slowing down of the pursuit of knowledge both before and after the sack of Baghdad. But the mantle was soon picked up in other parts of the Muslim world beyond the Abbasids' ruined capital. And that brings us back to Ibn Khaldun whose description of the destruction of Baghdad opened this lecture. Earlier authors from ancient Greece and Rome had grasped the essential truths or commonalities about the rise and fall of civilizations. But Ibn Khaldun, the brilliant medieval thinker from Tangier, was the first to provide a disinterested, comprehensive and myth-free theory of how and why this seems to take place. Today, anyone with even a passing acquaintance with world history sees the inevitability of empires and nations undergoing such periodic ups and downs. Addressing the same idea in a somewhat more lyrical vein, T.S. Eliot, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, offers the following lines of verse in his four quartets. In my beginning is my end. In succession, houses rise and fall, crumble are extended, are removed, destroyed, restored, or in their place is an open field or a factory or a bypass. Old stone to new building, old timber to new fires, old fires to ashes, 
and ashes to the earth. So can we expect another golden age? Certainly. We may be living in one now. But when and where the next golden age will occur is impossible to say. And perhaps it won't be limited to a single geographic region, even one so huge as the Muslim world from 750 to 1258 and afterward. One thing I will say, with a high degree of certainty, is that our species is hardwired to look forward, to try new things, to strive to do better. History has endless examples of the pitfalls that can lie along the way. But history is also replete with positive advancements and growth. And the Islamic Golden Age was a brilliant example of this. Whoa.